Well, now it's time to resume Lecture 8. And this is Part 2 of Lecture 8, and the lecture is on clutter rejection, MTI, and pulse Doppler processing, and it's part of the Introduction to Radar Systems course. Well, now it's move time to move on to pulse Doppler processing techniques. Here we're going to look at the whole concept of pulse Doppler filtering, and we're going to go over some basic concepts to understand pulse Doppler filtering in detail, and then we'll follow that with an example of the moving target detector, the so-called MTD uh, implementation, and then we'll uh, discuss range Doppler ambiguities, which will actually be in the third part of the lecture, and airborne radar, and summarize. But first, let's talk about these subjects. You've seen in the previous um, part of the lecture uh, this diagram, and it's the data collection diagram for Doppler processing. It shows you how data is collected when a number of pulses marked here in blue are transmitted, and here we see uh, the little dots uh, of the samples of the echoes that are received. And we see here, just to review it, uh, we see the pulses and then the echoes from that pulse, another pulse transmitted and its echoes, so that from pulse 1, this would be up here sample 12 at say 8 kilometers, and for pulse 2, sample 12, pulse 3, sample 12, and those samples uh, for a given pulse number, say pulse 1, all those samples would fill a row Okay, and this, uh, these points at, at pulse one, two, three, four, at a certain range would fill a column. And here would be the samples at a, the same range gate. Okay, and so the data that comes in from the radar receiver from these different pulses would first go through an A to D converter where it would be digitized. Uh, we'd sample both the real and the imaginary part of the, of the signal, the in phase and quadrature, I and Q samples, and these samples, the complex envelope of the received waveform, would f we'd use to fill up this, we visually show it as a matrix, what would fill up a memory. So we fill up the memory row at a time, and then we um, process it one range cell at a time. And the question is, how do we process these different, uh, where we have multiple returns from the same range cell uh, to give us Doppler resolution of the radar? Remember when we processed, when we were talking about MTI processing, we just send out two pulses and we'd subtract them, or three pulses and we take the first one minus twice the second plus the third one, and that would be a kind of filtering, uh, um, a, uh, a high-pass filter that would pass anything that was moving. Okay. Now we're going to look at much more complicated processing, where instead of just seeing if the target's moving, we're going to make an actual measurement of the target's velocity, radio velocity, that is. Now here we have those M pulses coming in, from the memory for one range gate, and they are processed in parallel through different filters. And this whole box in processing we call a Doppler filter bank. So those returns from the M pulses, I'll just say 32 pulses, from the 32 pulses in one range gate will be multiplied each of the returns the complex returns will be multiplied by a weight. And that set of weights has a certain set of Doppler characteristics which is shown here in this little curve. This curve is the gain characteristics in Doppler space of the set of weights that are used in filter one. Now I'm not going to get into the theory of how we develop these set of weights. That's more advanced for this elementary course but just take it sort of on faith that I can develop a series of weights which will give me a 
response in Doppler space that will pass certain Doppler velocities the x-axis is Doppler velocity the y-axis is the gain or how well the filter passes those Doppler velocities and so so this filter will pass this set of Doppler velocities and the uh, next filter will pass another set moved over and another set near the center of the Doppler domain and way down to the bottom uh, a, another filter this of course is a bunch of different filters in between that would pass the much higher Doppler f frequencies or Doppler velocities now I want to point out that the that this these curves are logarithmic that is to say that if a target was over in this d side um, it would be suppressed not just by the linear amount that these look like but by a lot like a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand times because this typically would be a thousand or ten thousand times lower than this peak response so it's not a linear shape that I'm plotting here it's a logarithmic shape and whereas a target was at this velocity it had come whomping right on through so if after a target went through filter one and it came out you know that its Doppler velocity is in this regime and you know that it's not the other thing to point out is if there was some clutter like rain clutter as we're going to see in the past and we looked a little bit about talked a little bit about rain clutter in the uh, clutter lecture the rain clutter would be suppressed and you could see a target I view these filters as speedometers for the targets and the whereas the MTI filter says is the target moving a set of Doppler filters like this say how fast it's moving and they make a direct measurement so what we're doing in this process of generating the output of the linear filter is we're coherently integrating all the pulses in the coherent processing interval and we're weighting the pulses differently and those weights will give in combination for that filter will will give preference to certain radio velocities to go out to be output from the filter and the set of Doppler filters covers the entire Doppler band we use this Doppler processing to reject clutter and we also use it to uh, resolve targets with different velocity segments so it allows for fine grain target radio velocity estimation okay now what I'm going to do now is to talk about an example called the moving target detector MTD and uh, this is a nice example to choose um, because it is used as an example in just about every modern radar textbook of a good Doppler processing system uh, you know it's it, and, and it's in an unclassified radar this system was developed for use in, uh, in the FAA's air traffic control radars it's gained use in, uh, in, in most pulse Doppler processing used in most modern radars now just about all of them but we can easily talk in the in open venue about this particular implementation um, and it, it, I might add it was developed here at Lincoln Laboratory in the mid 1970s now an interesting thing to add because many of you are learning about radar now and I've talked about in the past is why do you talk about MTI filtering at all why don't you just talk about this pulse Doppler processing well because radars have very long lifetimes and there are many radars out there that were built in earlier times before um, uh, these pulse Doppler processing techniques were available so in, for understanding radars that are out in the world today MTI techniques are important to understand okay uh, the second thing is is, is is the contrast the two is that this particular process the moving target detector implementation of a signal processor to reject clutter you couldn't have done it in the 50s and 60s because of the di digital revolution hadn't really come about it was only with the advent of the invention of integrated circuits to uh, a lot of people in college now integrated circuit seems like uh, a pencil you know I mean it's just like what do you mean in invention but back in the in the 70s was when 
the, the thought was that you could implement a lot of thi a lot of signal processing techniques that you could never have done before because there was an exponential growth in the power of what computers could do. Back in the 50s and 60s, the, the, the power that we had with transistors, uh, it, it would have been way too costly and, and huge in volume uh, to implement uh, a, a moving target detector. Just an impossible task to implement it in a, in a radar uh, with the technology available. It was just about ready to be done in the early to mid 70s and that's when it was done. Now that we've moved another whole generation later and we speak of uh, you know hundreds of gigaflops like, um, the implementation to the complexity of signal processing is just far more, far more uh, available to be done. It's, it's almost like saying signal processing is, is, an all, is now for most radars is a very small fraction of the cost of the radar. Um, so I'm going to show you this implementation and just compare it historically you know, between what we could do by, say back in the 60s and then in the mid 70s and you can just extrapolate now with Moore's Law uh, what we can do in the, in the year 2008 and beyond. Now uh, back in the, uh, in, the, in the days of the uh, 19, early, uh, say late 1960s, uh, an MTI processor would be implemented and you divide the radar coverage up into, into se segments that would say, oh, 22 degrees by 20, 25 miles or something. And you'd either have just the normal video unprocessed without an MTI, you'd process that whole area, or you'd process it through the M an MTI process. And the adaptive thresholding would be on that whole area. It wouldn't be on a specific range as the cell because you didn't have the power to do it. You know? And um, a, it was a time also where we weren't really understanding that hardware uh, and software in the algorithmic needed to get together in a, in a solid systems engineering point and, and be worked together in an integrated fashion. And, uh, and consequently uh, the, at those times, in many cases, the software people who would be doing the tracking would point to the uh, hardware people in the signal processor and say, it's their problem, they sent us these false alarms. And then the hardware people would say, ah, it's the software people, they can't develop a tracker to handle reasonable amounts of false alarms. Well, this digital, uh, digital revolution allowed solutions so that you could very nicely integrate the problem and come to a very nice Understanding. So what we was implemented in this MTD, for every range azimuth cell, for every CPI, co coherent processing interval and width by range cell, uh, and there were a couple hundred thousand of them in the coverage, um, a Doppler filter bank with eight or more Doppler filters. And then also, there was also a clutter map, which broke the range azimuth coverage up into 300,000 cells and uh, a zero velocity filter would just measure with a, a what's called a one pole recursive filter it would just build up and measure the ambient background in that very fine cell and store it in a clutter map and then uh, and, and this would be so that even if a target was flying tangentially to the radar if in that cell that was just receiving noise you could set an adaptive threshold that would see the target. Output of the Doppler filter bank would go into adaptive thresholding and we're going to see, uh, let's see, we looked in chapter in lecture 5 at the different adaptive thresholding techniques and an adaptive thresholding technique just about like what we went over in uh, lecture uh, 5 uh, was implemented for every range azimuth Doppler cell. So th this system was uh, adaptively thresholding every scan of the radar three and a half million cells. And then there was post adaptive thresholding, thresholding to get rid of stuff that leaked through. And this was in software. Uh, targets, since this was a low PRF radar, and you'll see what we mean by that in a later lecture, the, uh, the range measurement was 
uh, unambiguously measured, but the, uh, the Doppler measurement was uh, ambiguously measured. And so within a beam width, there were two different coherent processing intervals, and they were transmitted with different PR, PRFs, or pulse repetition frequency. The vo radio velocity of the ambiguous targets would move around in the Doppler filter bank and give the targets a chance to compete with noise, and it, even though it was raining in at least one of those two uh, PRFs. And then also birds and ground traffic are rejected through the post-processing thresholding and a second fine-grained clutter map. Here is the picture of the airport surveillance radar. This particular one is located in Boston. It looks I'm pretty sure that looks like the Boston skyline to me. So this would be the ASR-9 at Logan Airport. And here's a picture of the overlapping uh, filters in the ASR-9. After the MTD was tested as a prototype at Burlington, Vermont, its characteristics were put into the specifications for the FAA's ASR-9 procurement, and the, the MTD was implemented in the ASR-9. And over here we see an example of how the ASR-9 uh, could detect uh, targets in the presence of rain. Uh, here we see the the response, and again notice it's a logarithmic, the gain of the filter is logarithmic. We see the gain of one filter, and we have a target in the center of that filter. And here we see a, the target with a radial velocity of 30 knots. And of course that means if we've got a, uh, as you'll see when we discuss two view graphs later, that uh, this could be a target with a radial velocity, a true radial velocity of 30 knots, or one with a velocity of 130 knots that because of the um, so-called blind speeds, which we'll discuss two photographs later, alias down or folded over and appears in this filter. So the target is right here. And then we have rain echoes, which, well, the rain echoes seem to be coming from 60 to 100 knots. Well, it turns out this is m minus 20 knots uh, folds down in this visualization of the radio velocity folds down into plus 80. And you'll see an example when we talk about blind speeds, this, uh, any ambiguous velocity measurements, these folding over effects. So that in this case we have the aircraft competing um, at the peak, excuse me, of, of this Doppler filter and the rain echo being suppressed by the 40 dB down side lobes of the Doppler filter. So the rain echo would be suppressed and the target would be seen in this particular filter. Okay. Now what does this mean when you put it all together? Now remember I showed you in the um, lecture on clutter this very heavy rain that it was in uh, Atlantic City and here the the, the rain was just disgusting. It was 30 dB above receiving noise level. And it was the heaviest rain off summer in August of 75. And that was the day we chose to send up a pipe of Cherokee and fly through that rain. And here we see the uh, 40 scans of data that, that come out of the automatic tracker, radar only, not reinforced with a beacon or anything. And we see unity blip scan ratio of that pipe of Cherokee as it's flying around in this very heavy rain. So we're suppressing the rain and we're seeing the target like a piece of cake. There are a few false alarms and a few missed detections. We can see right here uh, a missed detection and right there there's a missed detection and we see there's a road leaving the radar and here are some detections from cars on the road. But pretty much the detection uh, is really quite good. Uh, and in fact, it was revolutionary for the time in 1975. And uh, over here we see a spectrum of the rain. And in this case, you see that the rain is offset. And if we took this spectrum and we displayed it, not going from minus 60 knots to plus 60 knots, but from zero to 120 knots, this rain would fold over up here so it would appear as though the rain had a high 
radial velocity. That has to do with the ambiguity in Doppler velocity measurements that you have in these low PRF radars, these airport surveillance radars. Okay, now let's talk about Doppler ambiguities. I've been now, um, and what that means is that targets can be moving um, at multiples of the PRF and appear to have the same radial velocity. Now, it, say we say for instance we have, uh, and, and we look at the uh, a target get, that's giving a constant return and we're plotting it in time divided by the PRF. Okay? And we sample at once every 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 PRF. So say the radar was transmitting pulses at um, a kilohertz and order a magnitude for an SBN radar that's a hundred miles an hour. Now if the target had no radial velocity we sampled it, we get a constant returns. And that says, gee, target isn't moving. We can't measure any any Doppler frequency from this. It appears to have zero frequency. So it ha appears to have zero frequency if we sample it and it's constant or zero velocity. Now say for instance that the target is moving at the unambiguous velocity, where the unambiguous velocity is the velocity that corresponds to the PRF. And we sample it once a pulse length, that once a time between pulse, we still get a constant value. So it appears as though a target that's moving at this unambiguous velocity, which is lambda times the PRF divided by 2 isn't, isn't moving at all. Or at three times the uh, uh, unambiguous velocity. So the Doppler pulse waveform samples targets with the sampling rate equal to the PRF. That sampling causes aliasing at multiple PRFs. That means that there'll be a folding down, that a target moving at the unambiguous velocity appears like zero. Three times the unambiguous velocity appears like it's not moving at all. What it also means that if the target were moving, say, at half the unambiguous velocity, or one and a half times the unambiguous velocity, or two and a half times the unambiguous velocity, you can't tell which it is because of the fold over, the aliasing. So two targets with, with Doppler velocities separated by an integer multiple of the PRF are undistinguishable. And so that what you have to do to see things unambiguously is tricks, which we're going to tell you about a little bit later, or you have to raise the PRF so that the you can see things unambiguously in velocity. Sometimes that's not possible, and that leads to complexity in the development of the radar. So the equation we're going to leave you with is we've got a constraint on things. This unambiguous velocity, the velocity from zero to this velocity that you can measure the velocity unambiguously is the wavelength of the radar times the pulse repetition frequency divided by two. Now let's look at range ambiguities. And let's take two targets. One, a distance r from the radar. Another one, a smaller target, a distance r2. And it's smaller probably in this case, because of the r to the fourth factor, the sensitivity of the echo coming back drops off as one over r to the fourth. But its range is that 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 range plus a range that we're going to call the unambiguous range of the radar. And the unambiguous range of the radar is just the round trip echo time between the two pulses. And 
capital T sub R, which is 1 over the PRF, is that time between the pulses you transmit. So the unambiguous range is C times the time between pulses divided by 2. Now, range ambiguities occur when the echoes from one pulse are not all received before the next pulse. So let's look down here. We've got pulses we're sending out. If we sent a pulse out here, and we sent no other pulses out, we get an echo back at this range from this target. There'd be that delay, and we get a delay, a lo much longer delay time from the smaller target, target two. But if we send out another pulse sooner than the echo that this pulse generates from the one before it, then we can't tell uh, when we listen after the second pulse whether the echo is from a target at R1, a target at distance R1 away, or R1 plus the unambiguous range. And so after we send out the second pulse, send out one pulse, then we send a second one out, you'll get both R1 and R2 coming back at the same time. And what that means is close targets, like clutter, say this was clutter, can mask weak, faraway targets that we want to see. And that gives a problem. So we have a, an ambiguity problem in range. So we've had a discussion of the unambiguous range and the unambiguous Doppler velocity. And as you might have noticed in the preceding two view graphs, these two equations which describe uh, uh, algebraically what the unambiguous velocity is and the unambiguous range each depend on the PRF and one of them depends on the wavelength of the radar. So what we can do is for each frequency band of radars that we talk about and here we picked a particular frequency within each of the bands, the major bands. And there, is, there are other bands too. I haven't put L band in here at one point. 3.5 or a C band, which is halfway between 3 and 10 gigahertz. Um, but for each of these different frequencies that radars operate at and have a corresponding wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation, there is a, a connection between the unambiguous range you can have and the unambiguous velocity that you have. And that's defined by this line. Okay. Now let's look at two different examples and see what this says. Um, and before I do the examples, I'll say this one graph says you can't have your cake and eat it too in most cases. Now uh, you can't unambiguously measure targets out to arbitrary range and arbitrary radio velocity with one set of pulses. And we'll get to, in later pieces of the lecture, how you do that unraveling of the ambiguities to actually measure the velocity. But let's look at now at these first two things. First, let's look at an air traffic control radar. And say we want an unambiguous range of a little below 150 kilometers. And that corresponds to a PRF of about 1,000. If we build the radar at 3 gigahertz, that means we're going to have uh, the order of um, 250 uh, meters per second of unambiguous velocity, which is about 100 miles an hour. And, but, but, but aircraft that fly around terminal areas go a lot faster than that. So the measurements that you make with an individual coherent processing interval of worth of processing with one PRF sent out are going to be, can be made to be unambiguous in range, but they'll be ambiguous in velocity. Okay. Uh, and as I alluded to earlier, for each beam with two sets of PRFs is sent out, and I'm going to show you later how we, with two sets of different PRFs, 
varying by 10 or 15 percent, you can um, uh, unravel the ambiguity in Doppler. Uh, we'll show that how we do that a little later. Now let's take another example. Say we have an airborne radar that's in the nose of a 747. It's used to see aircraft and weather and things that are up ahead of it. It wants to see, oh, say 50 miles under kilometers and so it wants an, uh, an unambiguous range of say, you know, the, we'll just pick this number uh, up here. Well, when we go down to 10, it, it also this radar wants to be able to see other planes that are coming towards it. And so it wants a reasonable beam width, you know, and, and add, uh, since the beam width is lambda over the aperture, when you only have an aperture of three feet to get reasonable beam width, you've got to go to high frequencies. You've got to make that lambda very small. And say we just pick 10 gigahertz, where you have three centimeters. That means at X band and the, this order of distance, you're going to have a very, very uh, low ambiguous velocity, like 30 kilometers per second. Now, say we make the unambiguous velocity we can see very high, 1,000 kilometers per second. That means the unambiguous range is going to be very small. So that means, you know, you can't, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. And these radars tend to operate here where both are ambiguous or one of the, you know. So these, these ambiguities come into play, and you have to deal with them. That's the message that I want to leave you with.